Welcome to Close Listening. I'm Zach Morgenstern, joined as always by silent co-host Ludwig von B. And today I'm going to be doing something a little different because I'm going to be trying to squeeze in a discussion of two pieces of media. Well, not really. Two very closely overlapping pieces of media. We're going to talk about a record and a movie. Now, this record is, of course, the soundtrack for the movie. But anyway, last Christmas I asked for a Jimmy Cliff record. And the reason for this is that he was a name that had been in the back of my musical conscious for years. So in 2010, my family was in Cleveland, so this was the one time I visited the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and that was the year that an artist who I hadn't heard of before named Jimmy Cliff had been inducted. And his name really resonated with me, because if you go through life, there's a good chance amongst the genres of music you'll have heard of, you know, of course, classical, jazz, blues, rock, folk, rap, country... Another one you're probably going to have heard of is reggae. Uh, and yet, despite it being one of these core genres of music, there's, there's really only one reggae artist uh, a lot of us who aren't from the Caribbean or maybe from Britain have heard of. You know the guy I'm talking about. <laughs> just to prove this point, I Google image searched reggae, and you just get pictures of Bob Marley for a while. Google image rock and roll, one of the first faces that come up is Alice Cooper. And no disrespect to him, but he's not one of the ten most famous rock stars that just shows the different way these two genres are seen in our culture. So when I went to the Rock and Roll of Hall of Fame, I had this sort of epiphany moment where I said, wait a minute, how can I only know Bob Marley? I've, I've got to know at least one other big reggae singer. Uh, so that thought was sort of put on a pin in the back of my mind. Then a couple years later, I got really into Cat Stevens, uh, and one of Cat Stevens' big songs, Wild World, also a hit for Jimmy Cliff. So again, I was made to think, okay, there's this Jimmy Cliff guy. A year later, uh, YouTube suggests this Willie Nelson music video for a song, The Harder They Come, and it was a, so a music video that Willie Nelson filmed in Jamaica. I looked up if he had written the song. He hadn't. It was a song originally by Jimmy Cliff. Uh, and I, I, I really liked that song, but never got my act together to listening to more Jimmy Cliff. Years later, I'm reading Paul Simon's biography, uh, and he was particularly affected by a protest song called Vietnam. Vietnam, again, written by Jimmy Cliff. So that's the point where I said, okay, I, I have to make this Jimmy Cliff guy part of my life. I asked for this record, get it for Christmas last year, and now finally getting the chance to really appreciate Jimmy Cliff and hoping to do more Jimmy Cliff reviews on the channel in future. So let's quickly go through the songs on The Harder They Come. Now being a soundtrack album, uh, there's not a ton of new Jimmy Cliff material on this one, so there are a few Jimmy Cliff songs, there's some reprises, and there are also some other reggae artists. So all uh, a lot of these songs, different artists, a lot of them different producers. Jimmy Cliff, notably, uh, is credited as the producer for his own songs, which I think is pretty cool. So track number one uh, is one of the recurring Jimmy Cliff tunes. It's called You Can Get It If You Really Want. Uh, it's a nice blend of motivation, but if you look at the lyrics closely, uh, there's some protest to it. Uh, when reading the basics in Jimmy Cliff's biography, apparently the British Conservative Party wanted to make this their election anthem, one year, and Jimmy Cliff objected to this, saying, you know, that he didn't do politics. And it's interesting because uh, the harder they come and the music in it, they're protest songs of the poor of how life is rigged against them. And yet the British Conservative Party heard the uplifting message in the song and figured, oh, anyone could see it in our society. Capitalism is a meritocracy. It's not unfair at all. Uh, but even as Jimmy Cliff is uplifting, he is nonetheless protesting against capitalism. And there's a kind of duality to Jimmy Cliff. Uh, so when I was watching uh, the special features for this movie, the director and co-writer of the film, Perry Henzel, he was inspired to cast Jimmy Cliff because of the photos on Cliff's first album. The cover photo made Cliff look like this young, innocent, friendly young man. Uh, and the picture on the back of him riding an electronic bike uh, it, it made him look like a bad boy, uh, to use a Jamaican-specific term, a rude boy. Uh, and he, he was really taken to this duality because the harder they come, as I get, I'm going to get to in a second, is a story about a rude boy. However, they have to make that rude boy at least initially likable. He, the character himself was based on a folk hero. Uh, and Jimmy Cliff said in another special feature on the DVD that he embraces that duality. He knows that 
a lot of his fans like the nice man in him and a lot of his fans like the rude boy. Track number two, uh, we get a different artist uh, from Jimmy. This artist is called Scotty. Uh, he has a very different sound. Well, Jimmy Cliff has this beautiful high-pitched voice, which again contributes to the angelic feel of Jimmy Cliff's personality. Uh, Scotty's singing is closer to talk singing uh, and relies on the backup singing for, for the melody. A uh, pretty classic ra ra raggy sound to this. You have a thumping rhythm guitar uh, playing some minor chords under it. And despite a fairly melancholy feel, it has uh, some hopeful lyrics. All I need from you is a good conversation, conversation, because it gives me sweet inspiration. And to tell you, I never felt this way before. I know that there is some way today. Love your brothers. Love your sisters. Track number three is The Rivers of Babylon. You may know this song because... Uh, Boney M uh, later were successful in recording it. Uh, it's the same song. It's a religious track about longing for the Holy Land, and the group singing at this time is the Melodians. Uh, there's a bit of a sparse sound. Uh, you hear a lot of bass, and uh, the voices aren't necessarily beautiful as individuals, but they, they come together uh, in, in quite a harmonious fashion. Track number four is called Many Rivers to Cross. Now, I don't know much about music production, but when I listen to this one, I this is why I thought it was pretty cool that Jimmy Cliff does his own producing uh, because his vocals are just so beautiful. They have this angelic soar soaring sound and then an organ is really the only instrument you hear below them. And I know from, you know, recording just fake organs on GarageBand, it's hard to get that organ sound just right because it can easily sound too thick and messy, but here just everything sounds beautiful. So it's this sort of mournful song. It's sung at a point in the movie where Cliff's character Ivan is feeling kind of hopeless and the idea of crossing the river, overcoming your battle, again it takes on a vague religious quality, kind of like the water is wide. Uh, track number five is called Sweet and Dandy. It's uh, by an artist called The Maytels. I uh, hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, it has a very different sound again than the Cliff songs. There's a striking rhythm guitar and gritty harmony vocals. Uh, the main voice in the Maytels is lower uh, and has a lot of texture to it, almost as if there's like a, a guiro in the singer's in his throat. So very different than Jimmy's sound, but I, I very much like what the Maytels are doing as well. Track number six, title track of the movie, the one, the one you're definitely not going to forget. It's called The Harder They Come. And Jimmy Cliff, uh, between this one and You Can Get It If You Really Want, seems to be the master of speaking very simply, yet getting a very distinct message to his song. So the one end, he has this left-wing critique of religion. You know, they say there's a pie in the sky, but we only get that pie when we die. Whereas, you know, we got to enjoy our life while we're here, we can't let the oppressors get to us. We have to resist. We have to be strong. Uh, Jimmy Cliff has a, had a complex relationship with religion over the years. I believe he was raised Christian, eventually converted to Islam. I, I don't know if he would call himself an atheist now. I, I, I think his most recent articulation of his religion is that he believes they all speak to some vague higher truth. So if someone asks to see a Rasta, he'll say yes. If someone asks to see a Muslim, he'll say yes. He's also quoted at some point as saying he believes science, so I don't know if that's code for he's even left that behind and is just an atheist. Uh, but a sort of tension with religion, a sort of both positive elements and uh, a, a critique is comes out in the song and it definitely comes out in the movie. Track number seven is called Johnny Too Bad. Uh, it's by a group called The Slickers. Uh, it has a relatively upbeat sound, but it's mixed with dark subject matter. I don't know if Johnny Too Bad was sort of like a stock character in Jamaican folklore before this, or the song invented it, uh, but yeah, the, the lyrics are sung very quickly, and they're a little bit dark, but again, because it's just a catchy song, not that dark. You're hurrying, you're shooting, you're losing, told you, you lo you're too bad. Uh, it also, this song also makes use of organs, so it actually connects kind of nicely uh, with the previous Jimmy Cliff song on the record, The Harder They Fall. Track number eight is 007, Shanty Town uh, by Desmond Decker. Perhaps another name in reggae I should know because he's the guy who recorded Israelites. Uh, there's a constant reggae beat under the song, and uh, there's a uh, reference to 007 and Ocean's Eleven. I don't, I don't actually know anything about James Bond, so I don't know if those two movies are connected, but I guess they must be. Track number nine is called Pressure Drop. We're hearing the Maytels again with that great deep guiro-y voice. Uh, this song is sung with a kind of frantic energy. Uh, so that, that lead singer whose voice I really like, his name is 
Toots, Hibbert, and, and I don't know exactly what pressure drop means in this context, but any lyric that's about movement uh, really helps make a song catchy, and that's exactly what Pressure Drop does here. Track number 10 is Sitting in Limbo. This is another Jimmy Cliff original. Uh, his high voice, uh, in contrast to Toots Hibbert's low voice, again, really catches you. Uh, and uh, this song is perhaps has a more spiritual, more religious affected feel than the previous songs because in the context of the movie, this is when Jimmy Cliff's character is not just in a bad place, but is really contemplating mortality. After that, if you get, if you, you can get it, if you really want, and the harder they come, both as reprises, uh, so in the context of the movie, the first time you hear The Harder They Come is when Jimmy Cliff's character Ivan is recording it in a studio, and then at the end it's played as the credits roll, and uh, what's happened to Ivan? Well, don't know exactly how much to... Okay, I'll, t I'll try not to spoil the, the complete trajectory of the movie. Uh, but the movie, directed, co-written by Perry Henzel, 1972, was seen as introducing reggae and Jamaica to the world. Uh, what was emphasized in the special features is that outside of Jamaica, uh, representations of the country would be more as a tourist destination that wouldn't focus on actual working class Jamaicans and perhaps the more dangerous parts of their life, those who fell afoul of the law. The movie itself, it's, it's kind of, it's, think of it as Elvis movie, so just, you know, story about the struggles of someone wanting to be a musician meets Joker. Uh, so Jimmy Cliff plays Ivan, who's this guy who, he's not having much luck getting a job. You see him riding home on a bus carrying a mango, uh, which I, is, the, is the result, I guess, of him, him not doing very well in his previous job. It's a single small mango. He talks to his mother who doesn't want him to live in her house. Uh, and then he goes around desperately trying to find a job. He says to a construction yard he can do anything, but they only want skilled workers. Uh, he somehow ends up living with this priest, but then the priest doesn't discuss, doesn't trust him as this music man. He thinks he's gonna corrupt his daughter, and eventually he gets uh, caught up uh, in the marijuana trade. Uh, and sort of, even as he's starting to have success as a popular singer, gets more and more in trouble with the, with the law. And so the similarity to Joker is he starts out as this victim of capitalism, but then he, he more and more compensates that by leaning into his rude boy side, uh, this guy who carries a gun and kind of likes it. And at one point he does this sort of silly badass pose. And apparently when they used to do sort of cult cinema screenings of the harder they come in, in Los Angeles, I think, Jimmy Cliff would come as a guest, and then in the middle of the movie, jump out in front of the gate, in front of the stage, and copy his own pose from the movie. The Perry Henzel, he was supposedly uh, really inspired by Italian neorealism, uh, so, you know, unlike Joker, and in fairness, you know, this one doesn't have the backdrop of Batman lore to work with, the film can, feels a bit realist at times, so if, if that's not the kind of thing you're into, if you don't watch a lot of indie films, the pacing might seem a bit slow. And at times there are weird jumps. Apparently, in order to maintain that realism, a lot of the script was improvised. So maybe I just wasn't paying great attention, but there are certain jumps uh, in Ivan's story that I didn't fully follow. Like, I was able to understand the film well enough that I could fill in the gaps. But, you know, how he ends up with the preacher, for example, I feel like there was a bit of a jump in the story there. Uh, but sort of a very cult, historically uh, significant film, uh, a great acting performance uh, from Jimmy Cliff. The, the one thing that frustrates me, I've, I've noticed with a lot of these musician movies, and in fairness, I haven't seen that many. I've seen a few Elvises, I've seen this, I've seen Purple Rain. They, when they sing, it's always because the character is also a singer. And I feel like the songs might have some more life and in turn breathe more life into the movie themselves. Uh, if it was done musical style, if they broke with realism and actually just sang the songs directly about what's happening. Whereas what happens in this movie is either he's singing as a singer, there are other reggae bands singing as singers, or when that doesn't make sense, they just play the music in the background and he's not singing. But apparently they did a stage musical of The Harder They Come, so they found a way to bring in that idea and I guess bring in some life to spice up Perry Hensel's 
original vision of realism. And yeah, I guess I won't spoil the end, but it's kind of ambiguous what happens. Apparently Perry Hensel was planning a sequel. Uh, and if you want to know what I mean about spoiling the movie, look up the quotations uh, Jimmy Cliff and Perry Hensel gave when they were asked, well, what kind of story would a sequel possibly be? So anyway, glad to enjoy both this film and uh, this excellent music. Uh, the music I unequivocally recommend. The film, it's more if you're a film buff person, but you know, of the sort of musicians acting in movies, this one is unequivocally an interesting, historically significant movie. So if you're a film buff, I'd recommend this too. Watch it on a big screen. I watched it on this tiny portable DVD player and the, the visuals, the, the colors and the grit of working class Jamaica are very important to it. So watch it on a, a big screen. I'm Zach Morgenstern. This is Ludwig von B. See you next time.